question is I, what do you think the private pension fund industry would need as a form of comfort um, if something like this would went ahead? Well, I don't think Eskom, I don't think any more government money should go to Eskom. And Sona said that. I think the solutions in Eskom are that you restructure Eskom. It's got the potential to produce 40,000 megawatts a year, and probably and that's enough cash flow to fund a financial restructure in Eskom. You can have good Eskom and bad Eskom when you normally do when you go into restructure. So the bad Eskom is the equity portion that the pension funds will take on as a risk that eventually there'll be enough cash flows from, from Eskom. You know, when Kasuli Madupi are going, and these things always take two years to get the teething problems out. Once those six-pack power stations are going, they churn out money for 30 or 40 years. These things are cash cars. But you've got to do them properly, you've got to maintain them, and we've got to give Eskom time to do that. <clears throat> so uh, the time we need, do we take that away from pensioners, <laughs> or do we spread it more broadly in society? Or do we look at ways of funding it through the markets? I think we need a combination of all of those. We need a restructure of Eskom. But I do think that to go to the PRC and the Government Employment Pension Fund and to create massive liabilities for that fund by throwing the whole Eskom issue onto them and saying, well, that's a cost. This, country, this economy is taking too many costs in the past. We've now got to start looking at how do we move forward without keeping throwing additional costs at us. So uh, I disagree with the, uh, with the PRC being the only solution to it, but I think Eskom can be, can be resolved. I think uh, there's sufficient cash flows in Eskom to keep going uh, and to keep it funding. What we need to do with Eskom is, of course, we've got to park it, and so let's fix it, because we've got to put another power station in. You know, the renewables can fill the gap, but we have to have another major six-pack power station in by the end of this decade which means you've either got to have another big coal station or we've got to have nuclear. <laughs> and horribly enough, nuclear is the best option because nuclear you can fund. The private sector will fund a nuclear station. There's no problem there because I know the cash flows and all the rest. So we've got to start looking at solutions. And that isn't that Eskom goes and builds the next big power station. It's that somehow in the pension fund industry and the economy and uh, government perhaps taking a minority stake, we start looking at those sort of solutions. So, uh, Azai, you probably want to say something. <clears throat> I think... If we just say the GPF or PIC should fund ESCOM, that's prescription, but only to a portion of society. And in itself is very discriminatory. You can't do that. Prescription in general is bad. It has been proven um, through, through our history. But there is no need for prescription. If you look in terms of the kind of returns pension funds get from traditional asset classes, they have been declining over time. If you look at the structure of the JAC, we had about just over 900 listed companies in the early 90s. Today, there are just about 350 companies. So the opportunity set has declined quite significantly on the JAC. Where are the opportunities? They are in the unlisted space. So if you look at the structure of the JAC from a sectoral composition point of view, and you look at the structure of the economy from a sectoral point of view, you can see there is a disalignment between the two. Men, or some sectors that are underrepresented on the JAC, they offer a lot of investment opportunities, but those investment opportunities that are in the unlisted space, which means the retirement sector has to look at investment differently in the sense that go beyond the listed space, but also this benchmark cognizant investment itself is also misplaced to an, ex to an extent. But I guess it also requires a conversation about what exactly is the retirement sector trying to solve for? Because currently it's solved for 16 million people, roughly, that are working and contributing to a pension, and it solves for their post-work life. What happens between now until I retire? It doesn't solve for that. So it has to look differently at how it addresses a, life, a person's life journey from the moment they work until they die. That's mm -hmm. how it should look at. So they must come with structures or instruments that facilitates my pension helping me now while I work and also helping me when I, when I retire. And I think that's a conversation that is not taking place. 
Great. Neela, you looks as if you wanted to reply to both yeah, Mike no, and I. Yeah, I, I mean, two things. Firstly, I think we need to be clear. It's a defined benefit fund. So mm -hmm. when we say it will cost the pensioners, that's not true. It costs the employer. The employer is the state. The, it does. I mean, Michael, you can tell me how else you explain it. Because, like I said, unless we go, but if we go to a partially funded fund like we had for many, many decades. One of the things you do, which I've uh, never done for about 10 years, is in increase the contribution rate. I'm saying so there are. So the government employee pension fund hasn't had a bigger contribution rate, which it should do. It's now going into periods of lower returns. The government should be putting more money in, and so should the. That's what I'm saying. Well, and then the taxpayer. So ends we up can paying. look at the contribution rate. I agree with 100%. So we don't just have to look at it being uh, funded by the fiscus. All the members of that fund could try and ensure that this thing stays yeah. a fully but funded, uh, defined benefit if fund. If they want to. But then the contribution rate has to go up, and that's, yeah. we have to look at the, whether people are willing to do that. I, I mean, historically, Labour has, members through their unions have said they would rather have a lower contribution rate and a lower funding level, because they trust the employer to make up the difference. You know, like I said, the people who tended to have a trouble were people who were on pension, because there's no particularly clear rule that says what the cost of living increase has to be. So that was where the problem came in. But for people who were going into pension, it is defined benefit. And I think people are, you know, we have very few defined benefit funds left, and maybe we're not used to thinking about what that means. But it does change the risk from the investment, from the employee to the employer. Having said that, I do think we also have to talk about ESCOM. You know, in the past yeah. year, ESCOM paid $25 billion in interest on its loans, and it made $20 billion in losses. Um, and I don't think it's that easy to say they can easily just recover from that. I mean, that's why people are talking about refinancing, because right now, they're, one of their main costs is interest. But also, there are some other problems, and I would disagree about the technology. I mean, I think the real problem with ESCOM is, um, and I'm not sure that Medupi and Kusile will either A, function better, or B, be cash cows. And the reason is this, that ESCOM is clinging to a very old business model, which relies on old-fashioned, very large coal plants. Those are some of the two largest, you know, they both are in the top 10 coal plants in the Southern Hemisphere in terms of size. Um, when we have all these newer and more nimble technologies that would work better. They've historically overestimated demand because they assumed that we would continue with the commodity boom that ended in 2011. And they invested based on the assumption that those high prices would continue so we'd have all the more refineries and mines and those are their main electricity users. In practice, the share of electricity going to the refineries has dropped from like 28% to 23% in the last seven years. And you know, that's, they didn't plan for that at all. And in fact, electricity demand has declined in the past 10 years. Mm -hmm. And so they're in a utility death spiral. And I do think they also have seen higher coal prices because coal prices went up with the commodity boom. And then we had depreciation. So when the coal prices internationally dropped, the coal price stayed high in demand. And then they started moving toward export parity rather than cost plus. So these are all very big problems. And it's easy to say, well, in two years, they'll be fixed. But I think mm -hmm. we need to think about what could happen to the economy if we have two more years of load shedding. Mm -hmm. Or it even gets worse, because if we don't fix ESCOM's finances, it's very hard to see how they can continue. Yeah? So it's either going to be some form of government bailout or some other clever form of financing. And in effect, this is an effort to say, what is the most efficient form of financing we can come up with? And where I totally agree with you is, if we can come up with better options, we should look at them. But I don't think sort of vaguely saying, well, but we have to protect pensioners. And then um, somehow somebody else will come up with some solution is going to work. And let me just flag, privatization also is not a panacea because the point is if ESCOM's not making money on these things, it's not so clear how the other guys will make money, no? um, unless they get a tariff hike. And historically what's happened when you privatize institutions like state-owned companies that are in this kind of situation, the first thing that happens is nurses starts getting lobbied to raise tariffs. 